Good evening, Portela Sur. I'm Cody Weddle in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with a damning report on CIA use of torture in the United States. The U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee released a report highly critical of the CIA's post-September 11th torture program. The committee found that aggressive techniques were used, including sleep deprivation for up to 180 hours, forced stress positions, and rectal rehydration. The report reveals that the techniques did not actually yield results. It also shows that 26 detainees were held wrongfully. In contrast to CIA representations, detainees were subjected to the most aggressive techniques immediately, stripped naked, diapered, physically struck, and put in various painful stress positions for long periods of time. They were deprived of sleep for days, in one case up to 180 hours, that's seven and a half days over a week with no sleep. Usually standing or in stress positions, at times with their hands tied together over their heads, chained to the ceiling. For the very latest on this story, we go to Alexandra Hall in Washington. The Senate Intelligence Committee has released a report of a five-year investigation into the CIA stepped-up detention and interrogation program following the September 11th attacks in 2001. The report details extensive use of waterboarding, sleep deprivation techniques, in one case having an inmate stay awake for up to 180 hours, uh, plus jail cells so cold that an inmate actually froze to death. It's important to note that uh, according to the report, these tactics were largely ineffective uh, for gathering intelligence that could prevent another attack and that they were much more severe than the agency actually led uh, Congress, the White House, uh, and the public to believe. Reporting in Washington, I'm Alexandra Hall for Telesur. According to the report released by the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee, in countries such as Poland, Romania, Afghanistan, Lithuania, and the Guantanamo base in Cuba, the CIA kept secret prisons where they applied enhanced interrogation techniques, the CIA euphemism for what many claim is torture. And moving on, in Peru today, the UN Secretary General spoke today at the UN Climate Change Conference. Ban Ki-moon has called for urgent action to combat climate change. Meanwhile, Bolivian President Evo Morales calls on the richest members of the United Nations to take responsibility for the role they have played in exasperating climate change and to reduce their emissions to avoid environmental disaster. He also claims that developing countries suffer the most even though they are the least responsible. To Colombia, Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos says that the disarmament and resources from drug trafficking will remain top issues during peace, peace talks with the FARC to end five decades of war. He also suggests that both sides renewing negotiations later this month after the FARC released a general. Santos says questions remain over what will happen to the group's arms arsenal in the event of peace. Now in October, the FARC ruled out surrendering its weapons as part of a peace deal. A guerrilla group has arms, and the crime of having arms is not a political crime. So how can you make peace when this crime is not a crime? This is an example that illustrates the types of problems and discussions that we need to achieve peace. And moving on, the UN Refugee Agency says that Western governments have heeded a call to take in more Syrian refugees from neighboring countries. It is, it is estimated that in all, more than 100,000 places will be offered in the coming months the organization wants to resettle 130,000 of the 3.2 million Syrians who are refugees. Today, 28 countries express their solidarity with the Syrian refugees, but also with the, the five neighboring countries that are hosting them, Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Iraq and Egypt, offering uh, what we estimate will be more than 100,000 opportunities for resettlement and humanitarian admission. Of these, we had 66,254 firm, concrete pledges. 
And staying with the Syrian refugee crisis in the midst of the civil war, we turn to Nashwan Abdullah for a report on the, on the latest. After the outbreak of the Syrian crisis in all provinces, many people were forced to escape their lives. The government accommodated many of them in schools and some government facilities as a temporary solution shielding them the cold of winter. We have uh, the winter plan trying to reach three and a half million people within Syria. The United Nations, uh, no doubt, has uh, is facing uh, financial difficulties in uh, trying to come up with funds needed to assist uh, these people. Syrian society believes it is necessary to stand together and share their pain and suffering, knowing that most of the affected are children and women. The refugee camps outside Syria are just prisons, and in my point of view, Syrian people must help each other. A three years and a half within the Syrian crisis, has revealed its effects on the Syrian street. And the first victim who pays the price is the Syrian citizen. Nashwan Abdullah, Telesur, Damascus, Syria. In Sierra Leone, the daily fight against Ebola is a struggle for the people. In Tombo, a rural fishing town in the west, nine people were buried just yesterday, like one woman who had been sick but refused to go to the hospital. She had been dead for three days in a house with 22 people. Oscar Pelde has the report. The mother did not want to go to the hospital and her son is dead inside the house. They still have not to come to collect the bodies. The woman, Fatumata Bangura, died three days ago. The family does not enter the house. They sleep in that store. So now we, we, we don't know, the mosquitoes are so plenty. So I think we can experience some kind of malaria. But as for me, I have some symptoms of malaria. They have been in quarantine since the husband of Fatumata died 15 days ago after he carried a relative on his back who was sick with Ebola and who had been rejected by the health center of Tombo. In that same house, four others have also died. The remaining 19 are still alive and do not protest. However, the neighbors do not understand how the rural West can continue to abandon them. Since the day before yesterday, when this woman died, we tried to call the burial team till now, they not come. Even when the community identified the sickly people, they don't come. The burial team finally arrived in the afternoon. They struck yesterday, you see, because of their payments. You see, they are struck yesterday, that's why they let for come today. The nine bodies collected by the command of the Red Cross have been buried in unmarked graves by neighbors and relatives in a field outside of Tombo, even though the majority of them were probably not infected by Ebola. The tenth body had not been collected. There is a baby under this blanket. It was born yesterday and died of a fever today in the house. Like his twin sister, they came into the world without assistance. This woman is the mother. Her baby did not die of Ebola, but of medical neglect. Suffering from the same neglect is his neighbor, whose 11-year-old daughter is vomiting. Like 90% of Tombo, she does not know how to read or write and has given her daughter two doses of adult anti-malarial medication. The government has been distributing this anti-malarial medication house by house. I told them that she was 11 years old and they told me, give her two, give her two. We are fighting to survive and adapt, but something is not working. From Tombo, Oscar Pelde for Telesur. Thanks to Oscar. And we end in sporting news today. The Australian and Indian cricket teams have played paid tribute to their fallen teammate, Philip Hughes. At the start of the test match, the teams and spectators applauded for 63 seconds in recognition of Hughes' final unbeaten score. They then watched a video narrated by cricket legend Richie Benald. Hughes died after being knocked unconscious by a ball. His father's best mate. There it is, a hundred on debut. Son, brother, fighter, friend, inspiration. Philip Hughes, forever. Rest in peace, son. More on those stories and others at our website, telesurtv.net slash English for Telesur English. I'm Cody Weddle.